when Pete asked me to come, uh, I said, boy, I'd just love to be here. One of, one of the things I enjoy about Pete, in fact, one of the, you might get emails from Pete, and uh, whatever the content is, which I can't remember really much of the content of his emails, but I do remember how you, <laughs> but I do remember how you signed them. He signs, and he's always done this from as long as I'm strength and courage, strength and courage. No yours truly, no, nothing like this strength and courage. So when I thought, well, we're going to go hang out with guys who love Pete Allenson, who are influenced by Pete Allenson, I said, we've got to talk about strength and courage. We've got to talk about where that really comes from. And that comes from a man called Joshua, a, a hero in the faith. So I thought... Uh, we would open our Bibles, hopefully you got your Bibles, or you got a phone that's got a Bible on it, because we're going to jump into the book of Joshua. What we're going to do, though, we're going to start, instead of Joshua 1, <clears throat> we're going to do, I think uh, I saw in the video that you guys did this with John, you went back and you reflected at the end of John before you dug into the beginning of John too much, we're going to do a little bit of that today. But when we talk to God about that first, Lord, I just am so grateful for a chance to be with men who vigorously pursue what it is to be a Christ follower, fully devoted Christ follower. And we know there's a whole bunch of guys in the room today, but we know there's even more men and women, boys and girls that are influenced by the men that are in this room right now. And what we hear and what we do with it and the adjustments we make is so much more than about each one of us. It's about them. So, Lord, would you give us grace to hear from you, not just for ourselves today, not to be consumers, but to be investors, to take what we're learning, to what we're gleaning, what we might get from your word, and how it can help us to be your man in the lives of those that we love the most, and those that we don't even love, and those that we might meet later today. But we're asking that you would do that. Please accomplish your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that is a big reason why I love being involved in ministry to men. It's not about the men, it's about all the people that the men impact. And that is not a forge idea, that is not an iron sharpens iron idea, that is the design of Almighty God. Now sometimes we step into that vigorously and sometimes we step away from it, but it doesn't matter, still the design of Almighty God is to build into us so that we can bless and build into others. So, let's take a look. Joshua, end of Joshua, last couple chapters, Joshua here is getting old. When I say he's getting old, uh, chapter 23 says he's old and well advanced in years, and that's a polite way of saying I'm over 100. We have any, anybody uh, in the room over 100 today? Okay, but how many guys are, who are pursuing that or are getting anywhere near it? Okay, you guys look relatively young. Uh, Joshua may be old, and clearly Joshua is failing physically, <clears throat> but Joshua is thriving spiritually. He's thriving. He's absolutely never been stronger in his spiritual health. His physical health is deteriorating. There's just no getting around that. But his spiritual health is on the rise. How's your spiritual health today? We have to be careful not to put it on cruise control especially after walking with God for decades, the temptation may not be to abandon the faith, but I do think the temptation, and I feel the temptation, is to just put it on cruise control. I was teaching my 16-year-old daughter the other day on Route 434 as we go from Winter Springs into Oviedo. I said, there's police officers here. <clears throat> Here's how you use cruise control. <laughs> she goes, well, cruise control can really be handy. Yeah, it can also be dangerous, though, and we had a little discussion about that. Cruise control for men like you and I can be very dangerous. There may be seasons that we're on cruise control, but when it comes to our spiritual health, our spiritual vitality, I think we all need to make a decision, probably daily, that that will not be happening. And so the fact that you're here today, I salute you. 
that's a good, that's a step in a, with good intentions that you do not want to see that happen. As we look at the balance of 23, going into 24, here's Joshua. He's meeting with guys. You know, Joshua, it's almost like a forge meeting. These guys get together all the time. They've been together not only for years, but for decades. Um, but let's flip over to chapter 24. Here it is. It's near the end of his life. And Joshua, maybe some of you are sensing this in, the, in your last quarter, if that's the quarter you're in. You're sensing, I just want to make sure that I pass on what I've learned and that I inspire others to live fully for the one true God. That's a little bit of where Joshua is today. I actually call Joshua a frustrated men's leader. Frustrated men's leader. Any frustrated men's leaders in the room? You're trying to mobilize guys. You're trying to help them walk with God, spur them on, help me, help you type of thing going on. Joshua's been a frustrated. He's seen the, the people of God, but specifically the men, because that's who he's gathered with them here at Shechem in chapter 24. He's gathered, in fact, he's gathered the uh, elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials of Israel, and they're presenting themselves to God. He's getting a, a group of men together because he got something that God's really laid on his heart. And he wants to make sure he communicates it personally and clearly. And that's what chapter 24 is really about. He's given them in this first few paragraphs in chapter 24, I'm going to say 1 to 13, those verses. He's given them a uh, kind of a historical account of how faithful God has been. Kind of a quick snapshot. Remember how faithful God has been to us. Not only to us, but to those before us. He's rock solid. You can trust him. He's been, uh, he's been with us, for us, this entire time. And then he sets the stage for where he really wants to go, which is to share up close and personal about what God's burdened him with. So take a moment, if you would, Verse 14, this frustrated men's leader, he's going to give them a personal exhortation. Now remember, the guys know him and he knows these guys. This is not uh, a guest speaker at Forge. This is someone who's been living life, you know, locking arms with men, in battles with men for years and years and really for decades. So let me go ahead and read this going to read a couple passages, a couple of verses here. Let's just do two verses, 14 and 15. These are probably the more visible or well-known verses from this passage. Now fear the Lord, Joshua says, and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Okay. Quick snapshot. He's looking at it. He's looking at the men. He's a little frustrated, but he's sharing his heart. And he just says, Here's what I'm going to do. How about you? Joshua's calling them out. You know, it's not a 21st century phenomenon that men of God will occasionally be double-minded. This happened 3,000 years ago. Guys are good for a while. They're bad for a while. They're good for a while. They're bad for a while. It's like, whose team are you on? What are you giving your life to? And so I think Joshua just feels like it's time and I don't think it's just because of his position. I think it's because he's burdened and he has, a, uh, he has enough of a relationship with these guys to say, what are you going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? So I guess I'd ask you guys. Do you talk to anyone that way? I'd ask you this too. Does anyone talk to you that way? Does anyone occasionally just come up and challenge you personally? Maybe they'll poke you in the chest. <laughs> but maybe they'll just look you eyeball to eyeball and just say, 
Really? Is that what you're going to do? Maybe it'll happen in a context like this. This would seem to be a setting where it could happen. Okay, let's keep looking. Joshua's exhorting them. You think, you know, I mean, this exhortation requires a response. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And it's almost like, (laughs) and the guys go, look at what they say. Then the people answered, the men. The man answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs among us. He protected us in our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Well, I mean, thinking, just put yourself in Joshua's position. Seems like... Okay, that, that almost feels like, a, like an amen. That almost seems like, hey, how many of you guys uh, are with me on this? Just bow your heads, raise up your hands. And they're all raising their hands. You're thinking Joshua's got to feel like, okay, mission accomplished. But it isn't. Remember, this is a relational gathering. This is not a guest speaker. This is someone who's lived life with these men. For decades. So look at, how, look at how he's responding. It's almost like he's saying, who are you guys kidding? So I, I guess I would pause and again reflect on myself and ask you to reflect. Anyone ever challenge you when you say you're going to do something? Yeah. I'm going to be uh, memorizing uh, John 1, 1 to 18. I saw Pete challenged, or at least somewhat challenged on that the other day. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Really? Good. I'll I'll do. I'll check you on it next week, or I'll pray for you on that. Maybe it's something to do with what's going on at work, or something that's going on at home, or marriage. You just kind of share some, and someone kind of puts back in in a maybe a gracious way, hopefully a gracious way. But a challenging way, in other words, not to always give you the benefit of doubt. I had a guy I uh, served in church leadership with for years, came up to me one day on his own initiative and said to me this. He said, oh, I don't want you to give me the benefit of the doubt. I go, well, what, what are you talking about? He goes, I want the rest of the world to give me the benefit of the doubt. But I want you, when you see something in my life, when you see my interactions, maybe with my wife and kids, when you see me using time or money or whatever it might be, I want you to ask me about it. I'll know it's coming because I'm asking you to ask me about it. But I need someone who's not going to give me the benefit of the doubt. Do you have anyone like that? Anyone that maybe you've initiated with and said, Would you please not give me the benefit of the doubt? If you see something, say something. Well, these men continued to insist, and it was back and forth. We're going to serve God. No, you're not. You're going to serve God. No, we're not. Finally, Joshua let it rest. Okay, you're going to serve God. You insist on it. Uh, Well, after that, they, uh, they then recorded their decision. I mean, you've got pen and paper here today. They didn't have pen and paper, but Joshua had, and he wrote it down. And there was a stone and a moment and a time and a place, and they marked the moment. They marked the moment when they said, once again, we too will serve this God. There needs to be times, and you know, now I've been walking with God for over 40 years. Can't be that long. Yeah has been (laughs) over 40 years. And there's just been moments where I just dug in a little deeper. Just dug in a little deeper. Just took that sword and stuck it in the ground and said, you know, this area of my life is being turned over. I'm going to start this new. Different moments, different markers. You see it all through, really. Book of Joshua. They often mark those moments with stones. Stones. Pile of stones sometimes. We need to have moments and markers in our life. And we need to be able to communicate them and talk to them about those that we influence. 
Talk to them about our, talk with them, maybe our kids and grandkids. Make sure they know those moments and markers so they can have a model for their own moments and markers. Well, before we get into Joshua and how he gets to become a man who has enough boldness to speak face to face, up front, nose to nose with other peers, just reflect before we flip over to chapter one, look in verse 15 with me again. <clears throat> I don't want to blow by this. Joshua is saying, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers and serve beyond the river or the gods the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. For me and my household. It just, it's almost like, what did you just say? For me and my household. Well, why, why? This is a men's time. It's forge. It's iron sharpens iron. What, where did, what does your household have to do with it? Wouldn't it be more appropriate if he just said, but as for me, I will serve the Lord. That's what I'm doing. Okay, well, that would seem to fit. But he says household. Where and why is Joshua speaking to his peers that way? Well, I've been thinking about that. Some insights, of course, into Hebrew culture. A lot more affirming, I think, of family and household. That kind of unit, very much part of daily life. Uh, this is not a, this situation is not America in 2019 where we embrace individualism. Very little individualism in Hebrew culture 3,000 years ago. It's all about the family. It's all about the household. It's all about collaborating and working together. So that's obviously got to be part of it. But I think there's more to it than that. Certainly, Joshua, when he's talking about household, is, is not just talking about me and my wife. You might say, well, that's all that's in my household right now. This is a different type of household. This is agrarian culture. They're farmers. They got lots of land. They got lots of kids to work lots of land. Joshua's household probably included not only his wife, but his kids, probably some in-laws, Probably some grandkids, maybe some great-grandkids. Maybe some people that he employed, workers and laborers. When Joshua is speaking to his peers about who's going to serve the Lord, he's not just saying, it's me, it's, the, it's my whole house. That's really what the word's coming from. It's a house. It's, it's, a, it's like when you say Beth Israel, the word Beth or Beth, that's the word here. It's house. It's a structure. It's a unit. It's a dwelling. Joshua says, everybody in my household... We are going to serve the Lord. Now I'm thinking, uh, uh, it seems confident slash arrogant that you're going to make that kind of commitment for every single member of your home. I'm not sure I could do that. Well, I'm not sure that uh, Joshua can really do it either. And I'm not sure that's what Joshua is doing. I'm not sure that he's saying and guaranteeing to his peers that every single member in my household will serve the living God for as long as they might live. But here's what I think he is saying. It's my intention that every single member of my entire household will serve the living God for as long as they live. That is my intention, and that is what I'm going to give everything I have for as long as I still have it here on earth toward that end. All that I've learned, all that God's given me, that's my priority. That's going to be my focus. And I'm telling you out loud so that you men can hold me accountable because that's why we declare things out loud. We declare them before God. We declare them before man. So that others, even if they don't say anything, we know that when they're looking at us, we go, oh yeah, there he is. Guy in my uh, discussion group at Forge. <laughs> I told him two weeks ago that I was going to do this. He's probably wondering how I'm doing. And he is wondering. Because you said it out loud. And that's the blessing of this time together. We say things out loud and may pray for us and they champion us and they cheerlead us. 
You know, when you're, when you're in something like this, you've got cheerleaders, men who are cheering you on. I think a little of that was going on with Joshua, but certainly he declared it out loud. Is this part of your pattern? Is it part of your pattern here on Tuesday mornings? To declare things, to say things out loud, to communicate verbally the intentions of your heart and how God stir in your heart. Well, certainly it's the model of Joshua. Not controlling his family, but influencing his family to serve the living God for as long as they might live. Let's go ahead. Let's get a little bit more insight into this man, Joshua. Flip with me to uh, chapter 1, and we'll close it out there. You might be thinking, well, Joshua's just awesome. He's always been awesome. He's just awesome. That's why they have a book in the Bible after him. I think Joshua is pretty awesome. I know you guys next week are going to be at the seminary, which is a pretty cool place to meet. Pretty, pretty sure Joshua didn't go to seminary, though. But you know what Joshua had? He had someone that uh, was his mentor. He had a guy who was investing in his life. He had a guy that he hung around for a long period of time. That man's name was Moses. Pretty awesome guy. You know, I know you're going to seminary next week, and now you can start telling people you go to seminary. <laughs> but meanwhile, do you have a mentor? Yeah, well, I'm kind of old for that now. Really? Maybe your mentor could be younger than you. I don't know that it's an age thing. Oh, this is just someone you kind of aspire to kind of want to be like. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a specific area of life. But certainly someone who might be a step ahead that you can just begin hanging out with and becoming more like. That's, that's really what discipleship is. Joshua would hang out with Moses. Maybe we need a Moses in our life. I think probably each one of us do. Okay, I'm going to read uh, just a couple verses here. It's all great stuff. I mean, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, after death of, death of Moses, servant of God. Now, this is God speaking to Joshua. Now, I'm going to slide right in at verse 6. This is, this is what I referenced earlier when I talked about Pete. God speaking to Joshua says, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and courageous. Be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Strong and courageous. I mean, God's saying to Joshua, do not be discouraged. And that's an order. I mean, I just thought, how, how can you order people's feelings? You know, my kids would go, stop feeling sad, and that's an order. It's like, like what? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a point here, but here's God saying, you're an influencer, Joshua. You're a leader. There's people looking at you. And that'd be true for every man in the room as well. You're a leader. You're an influencer. There are people looking at you. Be strong and courageous, and that's an order. And here, Joshua, this little nugget right in the middle of verses 6, 7, 8, and 9 is how you pull it off. I'm not just going to exhort you time after time to be strong and creators. I'm going to give you that silver bullet, that pathway, so that you can do exactly what I'm ordering you to do. That's verse 8. 
Take a look with me at verse 8. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. In other words, chew on it. Chew on it. Always be, it's always in your words. It's always in your conversation. You're always talking about this book of law, this word of God. Meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it. Don't just read it. Meditate. Think about it. Think about it. Mull it over. Chew it apart. Meditate on it day and night. Not just once in a while. Not just on Tuesday mornings at 7 o'clock. Not just on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Day and night. Day and night. How? Every day. Every day. Every night. Every night. Day and night. Day and night. Meditate on God's word. Chew on it. Talk about it. Think about it. Meditate on it. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Well, how do I be careful? You meditate on it. You think about it. You read it. You talk about it. You process it day and night, day and night, Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday and next week and next week and next month, every day. And then you just be careful to execute it. You don't execute it, but without being careful, first you have to be careful. How do you be careful? Well, first you make sure you're meditating on it. Day and night, day and night, personal time chewing on God's word. Okay, so today's Tuesday. But tomorrow's Wednesday. And then there's Thursday. (laughs) And then you're probably going to go to church on Sunday. Hopefully you are. If you're not going to church, let me encourage you to find a local community that you can gather with together every week. Maybe get involved in a small group. But don't just limit it to times like Tuesday. Way to go here. Way to, way to be here on Tuesday. You know, you communicate with your presence here today at Forge on Tuesday morning. You communicate, to, certainly to me, to Pete, to, to one another, that your intentions are honorable, noble, and you want to walk with God. That's why you're here. That's why you adjusted your schedule from what you're going to do tomorrow to be here today. But how do you pull it off? How do you move from good intention to good execution? Well, see, God has given us the pathway. God has showed us, really, in Joshua 1.8, of what to do to be strong and courageous, what to do to finish strong, what to do to be God's man in all the relationships that he's given to us. Lord, I pray for every man, myself included, that we would be men that wouldn't just limit it, limit our time together and time in your word to things like Forge. Thank you, Lord, for Forge. Thank you for the men that gather every single Tuesday morning. We bless you for the ministry of Forge. But Lord, I pray for Wednesday morning and Wednesday evening and Thursday morning and Thursday night that the men of Forge would be men who are in your word, meditating on it day and night. It would be characteristic of every man in the room. And if it's not right now at this moment, it would start today. That today would be a marker. Today would be a moment, even in our discussion right now, that we would process what we need to do to become men like this. Would you lead us and guide us in our discussion now? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, gentlemen, here we go. I I know y'all had much more to talk about around the table, but uh, uh, great stuff today. Let me do the Forge Essentials, then I'll wrap this up and get you out of here. If you're new for the first time, you wonder why we do the anvil. The anvil is our symbol that uh, God is building great men as God defines greatness. And that's what Forge is about, building great men as God defines greatness. And, and, and that means it's got to start with discipleship and following Jesus Christ. And yet, uh, we're not going to grow unless it's, there's iron sharpens iron. We need to get in the Forge where there's heat and truth, light and truth. And and then God shapes us, usually around the table, 
Uh, as we often say, this is a place where you can get hammered in the morning. And uh, but but it's a but it's a place it's a place where God hammers us, God shapes us, God develops us. So uh, continue to in, uh, invite your friends or enemies and, and promote ForgeBibleStudy.com. Build your fire team, guys. We've taught on this in the past, but this is where you get two to four guys doing what what Brian talked a lot about today. Really, uh, 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 guys that will fight for your faith. So who, who, who should you look for in that kind of a role? The guys on Thursday morning asked me, as guys that you like to be with, guys that you think are spiritually growing, guys that you can trust who will fight for you, hold you accountable, do a lot of the things that Brian said, powerful stuff. Uh, and, um, and so don't neglect that. Appreciate you guys who are partners. I don't tell you enough. Thank you for keeping us in the game. And as we move from here to RTS next week, uh, we'll, we'll continue to need that because the, uh, the baskets will be going away. There won't be that opportunity for you to give cash. Well, well, maybe, but um, not as much. What we need is the guys to go to ForgeBibleStudy.com and donate that way or to write a check still to Man in the Mirror, put Forge in the memo. But we, we do need your partnership as we go around town. And I want to I wanna say, uh, just remind you guys why we're moving to RTS. They're going to be doing some construction here and, uh, they, and, and that's going to come in the next few months. And uh, this will uh, give us a little opportunity to grow too in that room. We're where, where are we going to be at RTS? Follow the signs. Just took it. It's just up around the corner, right? And uh, we'll have all the Ford signs. Follow the Yellow Brick Road. I mean, the Ford signs into. You, you can't miss us. But let's thank Charlie is on the board here at Canterbury and Jim, who's out running around. And Ken, let's give Canterbury a round of applause. Thank you. So guys, that is next week. Don't forget we have downtown on Tuesdays now, but also that's next week for us. When are we starting at, uh, at Reform Seminary? Next week, right? Okay, next week, that's where we're at. And, um, and we'll be there. Uh, you, won't, you won't be able to miss us. All right, let me wrap this up. I, I love what Brian said. You know, Brian is a New Englander. How many of you picked that up? He's a New Englander. He's from, he's from Massachusetts. He's, I said, are you a Patriot fan? He says, of course. That's why it was so good having him sit next to a Steeler fan right over here. I love that. And uh, so that was good. And, the, and as far as I know, they didn't hit each other, you know. Um, but uh, what, what I like about New Englanders is they're straightforward. Uh, and we got a straightforward message today, didn't we? This was very, very, very important. I've, I've memorized that text. I love that text. And I've got several things here that next time when I preach it, it will be very similar to what you hear. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving him credit now so I don't have to do it down the road. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Nelson mentioned that this was kind of a, Joshua was an I am second kind of a leader, right? Not afraid to be a, a second man. He had a mentor. Do we? Do we have guys that we give opportunity to say, uh, don't give me the benefit of the doubt? Oh, I love that. Um, do we have guys that we challenge? Do we invite guys to challenge us? Um, um, do we have public markers in our own life? Uh, do we need to control everything? I mean, there's so many issues. You, you hit on all of my issues because I've got control issues. Uh, and I want to end by just telling you that the, uh, uh, at the beginning of last week, actually, all last week, I had to have a rental car because uh, Sunday night, my transmission went out. And uh, so uh, all last week, I had a rental car and my friends were saying to me, Where, where's your truck? And I said, I'm helping to put a guy's daughter through college. <laughs> Right, right? Cause, and I said, and they go, what? I go, well, my transmission's out, right? They go, oh, and everybody groans. Every, every man knows. When a transmission is out, what? Oh. So I had a rail car all last week, and I took the car, my truck. Yeah, I mean, I had it five days. They had my truck five days. And I, didn't, I was not happy about that. Anyway, I went in to pick it up on Friday, and, um, and he, he was totally up my cost, and I'm getting out my credit card, and uh, there's a girl that's totaling up things behind them. She goes, hey, Dad, is this the right amount? I go, Dad, you're the owner. Is this your daughter? She goes, yeah, I'm his daughter. I, go, I said, you're not by any chance in college, are you? <laughs> 
She said, as a matter of fact, I'm doing my master's at UCF. I said, I'm a prophet. I've been telling guys all week. I want you to know I'm a prophet. I've been, yeah, I've been helping. I, I, I've been telling people I'm putting help, uh, some guy's daughter through college. She goes, you are, man. You are. <laughs> so listen, here's the reality. I'm a prophet. Joshua was a prophet. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. And Brian's not. But. But what he gave us today was words from Joshua who played the role of a prophet, right? And so this is stuff, this is stuff that we can't just look at lightly. We got to process it. Would you process this this week with me as we go out of here right now? This is powerful and important and life-changing stuff. So thank you, Brian, for coming and being with us. Thank you for influencing our ministry of Forge this week. Let's pray together. And if you are, can stay to help us move the few things that we have. We got a truck. Uh, we had a couple of things we got to move over to RTS. A couple of you guys said you could. If you still can, come on up to the front. All right, let's do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the reality uh, that, that we are your called sons. Thank you that you love us more than we love ourselves. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for the gospel and how that grace in Christ energizes us, sets us free to be bold men that can invite this kind of growth that we saw. Uh, Lord, thank you that we don't have to control our families. As Brian said, but we can lead them. And so in in whatever way, Lord, as we head out here right now, um, help us to be leaders as we are your sons. For we pray these things in Jesus' strong name. Amen. All right, guys, have a great rest of the week. We'll see you next week.